Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and, and good, morning. good afternoon. Thanks for, thanks for coming on a Friday. Um, we're very excited to kick this uh, first event in a series, and it's intended for you, so however we can be helpful. Uh, initially, we're focused on the PAFA reauthorization, and as the series goes on, we'll also um, have some events related to the National uh, Defense Authorization Act and, and the Department of Defense role in, in biodefense and pandemic preparedness. Um, it's an amazing group we have today. Um, the Council on Strategic Risks is a fairly new uh, think tank. Uh, it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that was established about five years ago, and we have um, we work on uh, big existential uh, strategic risks, um, climate and security. We have the Center for Climate and Security. We have the Converging Risks Laboratory and the Jan Nolan Center on Strategic Weapons where I serve as a, as a senior fellow. Uh, and in that center we work on, on biosecurity issues and nuclear weapons policy issues. Today we have just an incredible uh, group of, of national treasures. Um, and I've had the chance during my 30-year uh, federal career to work with, with each of them in different capacities. They've served in the executive branch on both sides of the river, at the Pentagon, at the, the Humphrey Building, uh, at the White House, and they are here to offer their uh, experience <clears throat> to help you uh, help make history again with this reauthorization. We just, we're coming out of this pandemic and uh, this is an opportunity to actually uh, learn and apply uh, some of the lessons from the last few years. So I wanna just uh, turn it over to uh, John Moulton um, Deputy Director of the Nolan Center, who is going to uh, to moderate this uh, this event. So thank you very much for coming. And and uh, as I said, this is for you. So going forward, if there are topics or speakers that you'd like us to to involve, or uh, um, if the format uh, was you want to make it different, more of a sort of sit around a round table format, that's also fine. So. Thank you very much. John? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it and thank you everyone for making the time to come over here today um, and especially the support we've seen for this issue from um, Chair Rogers and uh, Ranking Member Pallone and then also on the Senate side uh, and also um, Rep. Tyson and Ishu also for the R5 earlier this year. We appreciate that. And then on the Senate help side with um, Chair Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and then Senators Casey and Senator Romney. So thank you all for, for that help. Um, a lot has changed when you looked at when we first had the, um, the act go through in 2006. When you look at it, we've had nation state use of chemicals, weapons, um, the role of information has changed in terms of data analytics, in terms of mis and disinformation on biological weapons, um, increasing international trade, international travel, climate change, cyber activity, and we've had a global pandemic. So it's a lot to reflect upon when we look at reauthorizing this, and that's why we thought it was so important at the Council on Strategic Risks to grab the leaders that have helped shepherd this organization through that. Um, so we're gonna start off with just some opening remarks from each of the speakers, and then we'll get into some question and answers. But again, we'd really like to hear what you're interested in so we can help this reauthorization go through. Um, Dr. Uh, Vanderweg, would you like to start? I can. <clears throat> it's so good to see some of you again. Uh, last time I visited with some of you was with uh, Tom Agensby and the folks from the Biosecurity Center. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Craig Van Wagen. I'm a family doc from Sydney, New Mexico, which is an Indian Pueblo in far western New Mexico. Uh, I spent uh, 30 years in the public health service uniform, Steve, old man. Um, most of that time was with Indian Health Service, although I did teach at the Uniform Services University. And later in my career, I got involved in disaster response, and that's how I ended up at ASPR. Uh, so Kevin and I had experience with Balkan refugees, and we had 9-11, and we had Afghanistan, and we had Iraq, and we had Indonesia with the tsunami, and Katrina, 
uh, etc. All of that in my time and being involved in each and every one of those events. Historically, let me quickly review in 2005, 2006, late 2005, you recall, we'd been through the chaos of Katrina. And this is after we had been through 9-11, the anthrax exposures, and then we started two wars. And when Katrina hit, it was absolute chaos on the ground. And um, that was unacceptable. Now, I got assigned down there about 10 days into the event when Thad Allen went down to kind of take over when Brownie got fired. And uh, we tried to change the environment radically. And I think that we smoothed out a lot of that chaos, engaged the local community, engaged the state very aggressively, and we brought many of the HHS elements into play more effectively than what had happened prior. Well, this, of course, led the Congress and the executive branch to consider what the heck went wrong and why did this happen. And both of those entities, the executive branch, under uh, Frank Townsend, you recall at that time we had a Homeland Security Council in addition to a National Security Council. Under uh, Fran's guidance and direction, the executive branch conducted an analysis of what failed, and the Congress did the same. And Kevin and I, among other people, were assigned to a team within HHS to try and address the 150 recommendations for improvement that were offered to HHS. And shortly thereafter, Senator Burr and his team brought to the table a proposal for a Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. They recognized that it had to be all hazards. Yes, pandemic was front, and front of mind, but it had to be all hazards because we've been confronting it. And the first thing they did was identify the need for a clear and unaccept unexceptionally identified leader for public health and medical response. And they called out the Secretary of HHS. They identified ASPR as a new position that would serve as the Secretary's advisor on these matters, direct VARDA and the SNS, and would also uh, be available to manage operational reality. Kevin and Jerry and I were tagged with making this thing go. Unfortunately, we had a secretary in Mike Levitt who had had two terms as a governor, was an executive, had experienced in 1992 with the Olympics in Salt Lake City a significant event at the airport. And he understood that these challenges would confront us on an ongoing basis. He also commented, and I told Joe that, that no politician looks good in a disaster. And so his approach was to embrace the notion that, yes, okay, I'm the lead, I have the policy responsibility, but in fact, I need an operational unit of professionals to execute against this mission to support the state, territorial, tribal, and local governments when they confront the disasters. And that's the charge that he put to us. And so we took that very seriously, and that's what we tried to build out. Now, in the intervening years, ASPR has lost that engagement and the ability to lead and guide effectively a cross federal government support to the state, tribal, territorial, and local entities. And I think this is a critical issue that you ought to be thinking about as you think about this reauthorization. How do we provide clear operational responsibility for these health assets in partnership with FEMA to support the state, tribal, territorial, and local governments effectively? What are the tools that are needed and how could we support that? Second thing I would bring to your attention is data. And some of you uh, at the health committee heard uh, Dr. Califf speak to the notion that if we're going to deal with shortages, we need to have an effective data set to understand that. And Dr. Califf and I were members of a committee that were funded under the CARES Act by the Congress to study the security of the medical supply chain. And we fully agreed about the need for this kind of transparency and database from raw materials to distribution. 
That should be coordinated across the department. And I would argue that you ought to consider making Asbury a responsible party for situational awareness across the department that embodies public health surveillance information, supply chain information that would generally fall within the purview of FDA, as well as an examination of the medical delivery system and the data important to understand where the risks and vulnerabilities are there in staff, space, and stuff. The last thing I would say to you is the supply chain is and a critically important piece here. And again, the recommendations that we provided to the Congress and to the executive branch from the National Academy of Medicine, I think really offer you some clear uh, <coughs> strategic thinking about how you can do that and some of the operational tools that you can employ to improve the security of that medical supply chain. So be thinking about these issues. You'll hear more about some of this in greater detail and from a different perspective from my colleagues up here. But leadership, first and foremost. Secondly, data and a coherent common operating picture across the department that's shared with the states and locals. And then supply chain issues that help us to understand raw material to distribution where our vulnerabilities and risks are, and what the mitigation opportunities are to reduce that risk. So those are my three thoughts to start. Maybe I took more than my five minutes, but there you go. Great, thanks Dr. Van I appreciate it. And then going down to the other end, Dr. Parker, please. Sure, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to, to be here today and talk about some of these, um, these issues. And actually, as, um, I just realized as we sat down um, the table here. Um, I, I'm dating myself here, but I'm the only one that preceded, uh, was at HHS and the predecessor organization, Office of Public Health Emergency Preparedness, before ASPR, before my colleagues here. And so, um, and I, I arrived, um, Craig de de described very well the chaos and the challenges of, of Hurricane Katrina, and I arrived um, to be the, uh, the principal deputy um, assistant for OPEP uh, in July of. 2005, just about 30 days to exactly before Hurricane Katrina hit, and so that was a that was a devastating um, event for our country and for our emergency management uh, enterprise and the public health uh, response um, uh, all around. Um, but I do think that we learned something from that, and what came of that was uh, the pandemic and all has its preparedness act and the establishment of. Of Asper and the establishment of, of BARDA with that. In fact, it was during the early days of Katrina when Craig and I uh, first, first met. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, at the time, it was Stuart Simonson, who was the assistant secretary for OPEP, said, Go get bandwagon. We need them on the ground. <laughs> and so that's when we met. Um, and we formed a strong bond, friendship uh, since that, that time that was tested in battle. Well, ASPR was established to coordinate and lead the federal medical and public health preparedness and response to all hazards. It was formed to support state, local, and tribal authorities, as well as the private sector and other NGOs. And it was established to affect, to develop effective public-private partnerships to deliver health security medical countermeasures. That's what we called it at the time. That's how they were labeled in Project Bioshield at the time. So BARDA was established to do that mission. And interesting, during that time, we were just talking, it was there in 2005, 2009, 2010 time frame. We had a major initiative that was led by um, President um, George Bush and Michael Levitt at HHS was the H5N1 Influenza Pandemic Preparedness Initiative. There was a strategy that was released for that in 2005 on the heels of Hurricane Katrina, so we were able to keep some focus. We were dealing with a disaster, uh, was the largest disaster we had to deal with in our country at that up to, until that time, but there was, there was some that were still focused on how we could initiate this H5N1 Pandemic Preparedness. And, that, that um, emergency supplemental rolled out at the end of 2005, if I remember correctly. It was ultimately funded by Congress at the tune of around $6 billion. That was, that was unheard of at the time for public health preparedness. 
Um, but over the course of three to four years, the implementation plan for that, and Dr. Kathak was leading some of that charge from the White House as the special assistant to the president for biodefense and health security. We, we made, uh, I believe, we made unprecedented progress um, that was due to a very detailed implementation plan and leadership that held us all accountable for, for achieving the milestones and mech that were in this very detailed implementation plan. But somehow that, that the lessons of, of that success of how to do that is somehow atrophied over, over the years. And when people ask me, what do, is there a good example of what we've done in the past with strategies and plans for biodefense, pandemic preparedness, I always point to that. Is there, there, there is a, a roadmap of how to do this, and we've done it in the past. Um, and so back to ASPR and the kind of the three big things, and coordinate and lead, support, um, and, and develop effective public-private partnerships. Those attributes have not changed since the original pop and the original establishment of, of ASPR. I guess what has changed is our understanding of how to implement strategies to achieve the, that desired end state. And so I think, you know, what my, my ask to you is really, you know, try to incorporate um, what is needed to really breathe life into what it means to have a support state and local authorities, how to build effective public-private partnerships that are needed for our medical countermeasure enterprise. What are the capacities that ASPR needs to do that? So that's, that's what my, my ask is really give that a lot of considered thought. I think, and there's some examples that I think that are worth to mention. And the COVID-19 response, you know, although we don't have a formal act, lessons learned after action report, we're beginning to understand what some of those after action lessons observed were and we need to turn into lessons learned. And certainly the scientific enterprise is one of the true successes. And I would say, especially from some of the scientific disciplines, that were a part of kind of the biodefense enterprise. They were important too, but there were scientists all across the country and all across the world that just brought their capabilities and expertise to bear. You know, I think about PPP, PPE, and how to reuse PPE as an example. Uh, but it was, it was really, truly amazing. Um, and, but on the medical countermeasures front, Operation Warp Speed really demonstrated the value of leadership for the shared vision and laser-focused attention and discipline to implement a strategy. Kind of like, that's kind of like the H5N1 influenza preparedness activities of, of 2005 to 2009 timeframe. It was leadership, shared vision, discipline, focused attention to detail. How, how, can you legislate that? I'm not sure you can. But I think you can set up some ecosystems that will enable leadership, coordination, collaboration, and innovation to be more effective than it is today. So I don't know if I have the right answers of how to, how to do that, but I think that's something to, to consider, to think about what is the ecosystem to enable that. And importantly, we need to under, incorporate and fully understand the pay, painful lessons learned from supply chain dependencies on foreign sources and the need for situational awareness to real-time data sharing and analytics and the need to have an effective control tower concept for medical countermeasure development enterprise and also to better support the healthcare system throughout the United States during times of crisis. And these are the type of capacities that ASPR needs to support state, local, tribal authorities, the medical countermeasures enterprise, and the healthcare system as we look to the future. ASPR has the tools. They have BARDA, they have the SNS now, they have industrial supply chain management responsibilities, they have the NDMS, they have HPP. But does ASPR have sufficient authorities and resources to integrate these activities to better support others? That's the question. And how do we do that? And then finally, ASPR's leadership role as an operative, operating division needs to be fully articulated and understood. And finally, finally a question, will PAPA include provisions to address some of the biosafety and biosecurity concerns that have come to our, our attention, um, such as the findings and recommendations that have been included in the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity's March 2023 report. So with that, I just uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and look forward to engaging in, in the discussion today and as we go forward. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Dr. Yeski? 
Sure, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, I am Kevin Yesty. I uh, am an emergency physician by training, uh, spent a career in the public health service as a commission corps officer, bouncing around the various <laughs> operating divisions and staff divisions of HHS for a career, uh, and wound up in Asper uh, towards the end of my, end of my uh, federal career. Uh, I've served three of the four Aspers, I've served with Dr. Vanderwagen, uh, served with Dr. Lori, and then uh, Dr. Cadlett, uh, although I wasn't an Asper that entire time. Uh, but it was, a, it was a good experience to have good mentors, good leadership, and a, a great mission. I just want to emphasize how powerful Asper and its best can be. And we all think of you know the, the, the broad, big concepts and the big pictures of Asper. Warp speed is a good example of that big national, international, global program where we brought the power of science and, and some of the best thinkers in the world and the private sector to create vaccines in a, in a great time of need. But I also want to remind everyone about the NDMS mission, the National Disaster Med Medi Medicine Medical System uh, mission and the power that ASPR has in providing medical care and augmenting medical care in areas that have been hit by disasters. Those individual patients that get taken care of greatly appreciate and great and get a great opportunity to see the power of the federal government in action is something that's important to them as individuals. That's a really powerful tool that uh, the federal government has to take care of people in need. And I just uh, wanted to, wanted to say, say that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a couple of different things that are related to that. Uh, but, yeah, you know, the challenge of going third is everyone's already stolen my stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, 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 there may be some redundancy here. And uh, a little bit about operational pieces of Asper, and, and because that doesn't get a lot of, it's not a big budget item in at, in the Asper, and, but it, and it doesn't get a lot of attention. But it, it really does some phenomenal things. Uh, Asper leads the emergency support function number eight. Uh, Public Health and Medical Services uh, for the National Response Framework. So anytime there's a, a federal declaration of a disaster and the SF-8 is activated, ASPR steps in and leads that across the federal government, the federal partners. And that has a broad range of activities that are performed, everything from behavioral health to mortuary services and victim identification. And uh, that, that ASPR leads that. It supports national special security events, State of the Union. Uh, we, we support the uh, Office of the Attending Physician here in the Capitol, state funerals. And if you go out on the uh, mall on the 4th of July for the fireworks, there's ASPR teams out there providing medical care so people can go home after seeing the fireworks and not having spent a day in the uh, emergency department at Washington Hospital Center because of a sprained ankle or a bruise or trip or fall. It uh, gives them a good memory of what DC is and what, how DC works. Uh, Asper's operations depend heavily on good relationships, and I think this is, should be one of the P's and POPs partnerships. Uh, we need good relationships, and Asper de depends on good relationships and, and, and partnerships with uh, our federal partners. FEMA, uh, for example, the ambulance contract, DOD, uh, National Disaster Medical System or NDMS patient transport, VA, NDMS definitive care, and others. Also depend uh, greatly on good relationships with uh, HHS partnerships, or HHS partners like FDA, ACF, Indian Health Service, NIH, CDC, and others. The system depends heavily on intermittent employees from the civilian sector, from the civilian healthcare sector for NDMS. Four to 5,000 people uh, who, who are intermittent empl uh, employees of the federal government have civilian jobs, and then they get activated during disasters and uh, support the, the medical care as well as the incident management teams that coordinate the efforts in the field. None of this works without the support and the coordination and integration with our state, territorial, tribal, and local partners. And after I left ASPR in 2020, I went to work for uh, uh, the state of Pennsylvania in the office of uh, the secretary in the Department of Health and, and was, was a COVID advisor there for a period of time before the Secretary of Health became the ASH at, uh, at HHS. Uh, so uh, got a, had a good understanding of how states work and how local locals work with private partners, but it was really, a, it, was a, it was a good learning curve. Got to see how the different power workers and that, and subsequently I've had 
the ability to work with health healthcare coalitions at the state level. Response begins at the local level. It ends at the local level. Okay, so we have to understand how that works and, and how those partnerships go on. And it's true for states as it is for tribes, as it is for territories, as it is for large municipalities. And so it's important for us to understand the hazards, the threats, the vulnerabilities, and the plans. Because in my experience, different organizations, different jurisdictions have different strengths and they have different weaknesses despite being in the same state. And uh, that, that's a challenge. So the, the support of ASPR is to understand those problems, look at shared responsibilities, look at the plans and make sure they're coordinated and integrated. Uh, and that's a process that I like to say is, is not building federal programs, but building national programs. Mm -hmm. You start at the local level, they have a share. You go to the state or the county level, which in, in my state is a, is a very powerful organization and they, they kind of coordinate things for the state, the emergency management offices. But you, you go local, county, state, federal, uh, and augment as you go along. Resource locally, procure locally, and then build out. And that includes the private sector. That's not just elected officials. That's not just government office. That includes the private sector because they have a they have a share of the the, uh, the viability of those of those communities. And if they fail, the communities fail. And if the communities fail, the businesses fail. So they need they need ask for support. The SLTTs need ask for, ask for support, but they also need technical support. In, they need support during disasters, but they need it in between disasters. I think that was the success of FEMA after Katrina and the, and the peak camera, the post-Katrina Emergency Management Act forced FEMA to take this whole of community approach to uh, management and not just support communities when there's a disaster, when they fail, but to support them in between those failures and build up their resilience. Not just help them sustain, but build up resilience in those communities and work with them side by side all the time. I think, you know, despite after having regional offices, that day-to-day -day encounter, that embedding of, of, of ASPR uh, staff in those offices on a day-to-day -day basis to understand all those hazards, threats, vulnerabilities, weaknesses, strengths, plans, make sure they're coordinated, uh, it is an important component that will enhance ASPR's ability to not only help build preparedness, help build response, but build readiness. Well, you know, and they can communicate freely back and forth with ASPR about they're ready, they're not ready, and help them do that. Also gives them an opportunity to participate in exercises. And uh, you know, to, to, to assess for help, for instance, healthcare coalitions, assess their, their real ability to perform when they need to perform. So I, I think those are those are probably the, the, the points I'd like to, uh, to bring across. I mean, as for you know, there's lots of there's lots of other components that go into healthcare preparedness. It's reimbursement versus episodic funding for for things. It's uh, a, you know, workforce is a big problem now. Is you know, people are leaving the workforce, people for retirement, they're they're burnt out, taking care of the workforce and, and, and things like that. So I think those are other issues that, that need to be addressed. So I will stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeski. Dr. Kevin? Well, thank you. And again, I'd like to thank CSR for uh, for hosting this and certainly for the staffers who are here today for taking time uh, to kind of hear maybe some of our stories, but more importantly, understand what our priorities collectively may be going forward with this reauthorization. I'd just like to have you kind of think about broadly in maybe four categories or three categories, what are the buckets that you can talk about, Papa and Asper about? One of the authorities and the relationships that exist in that document. The second is really the programs that you have to kind of manage in that process. And then the third thing is, is the resources. And then I, the fourth thing I think most importantly is understand or somehow characterize the world that we live in that ASPR and the healthcare system of the United States are gonna to have to manage going forward. And so let me start with the last one really briefly because I think that sometimes is underestimated or underappreciated. And one thing I'd like to do if I could, maybe after this session is send through CSR the most recent annual uh, threat analysis done by the D uh, Director of National Intelligence, which is a, a document that is briefed in front of the uh, intelligence community uh, committees, both in the House and the Senate. They kind of outlined the annual kind of what does the future look like, both near-term and long-term. 
And that is really kind of like the future that, quite frankly, we have to prepare for. So I'll just comment on that. When the original POPA was uh, originally drafted, and I happened to be the staff director for Senator Burr in 2005 and 2006 to do that, uh, the world looked like we have a terrorism problem, we have a influenza pandemic influenza problem, and we have this increasing problem with very severe storms. Well, those things remain the case, obviously, but add to that now the issues of cyber, the issues of misinformation, disinformation, add to that um, the issues that would relate from state actors that could include the use of CBRN. Uh, chemical, biological, radionuclear weapons that we never had to deal with back in uh, 20 years ago. So that's one thing to kind of characterize what's the world that Asper is going to have to live and operate in going forward. The second thing is, is the authorities and relationships. You heard about the relationships, but let me tell you unequivocally, our number one customer is the American citizen in the state and local level and the tribal level areas. That's who we work for every day. And certainly in a crisis, we need to be able to respond to help them get through the toughest day of their lives and reduce morbidity and mortality. And that's kind of important because one of the big vehicles that Kevin brought up is our relationship and role with FEMA that, quite frankly, I think has to be strengthened. Uh, it, has been, it was bifurcated. Uh, my first experience five days into the event, much like uh, Jerry Parker's, <laughs> is uh, mine was a little quicker than his, but I had three major hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Uh, within the first week of my tenure at Asper. And one of the things we recognized was that we were embedded with FEMA at the national level, at the, at the, certainly at the regional level, and quite frankly, uh, in the event of a crisis. And so we had worked hard on that, but I think that's something that has to be expanded. Why? Because FEMA has, as a result, result of Katrina and other events, become a better, closer partner with state and local authorities through the state emergency managers. And yes, the health officers are part of that, but they don't deal on a daily basis with the potential crisis that may happen in a given state, whether that be fire, flood, earthquake, or uh, pandemic, for that matter. And so that's one area I would suggest to you. The second area is, is that ASPR is supposed to have three enabling relationships with three important groups. You heard about the public-private partnership and warp speed. That really was the taking the best of American industry, melding it with the expertise within the Department of HHS and with the muscle of, of uh, DOD to execute something that no one thought could be done. And that is something that, quite frankly, we need to be able to do again and again and again in the future because this won't be the last pandemic, it won't be the last emerging infectious disease, and it may not be the last disaster of a mag magnitude of Cascadia earthquake in, in northwestern United States or a terrible event that could be another catastrophic hurricane in a major metropolitan area. So the third thing is on this area is, is that within HHS, ASPR is supposed to coordinate that effort. That was not well done in the course of the pandemic, I'll tell you that. Uh, at the point in time where the decision was made to kind of activate the ASPR in that role, the White House, quite frankly, eliminated my participation in the White House Task Force. That seems kind of crazy, but it's what's happened. But I think the thing is, now that there is a role in the White House defined with PREVENT Act, I think there needs to be some recognition that that is a good thing, number one. Number two, it's got to be articulated what the roles, defined roles are between those activities. But I think you have to realize that that is something that was necessary, but it's got to be workable so that at the strategic level, the White House kind of operates as it does, oftentimes with both strategic national and political interests. But it's got to be someone like the Asper that looks out and says, what do I need to do to mobilize every ounce of HHS and the federal interagency to respond to an event? Mm -hmm. And that is under the emergency support function number eight that Kevin talked about. That was something that worked actually reasonably well during the, uh, during the course of the, of the pandemic, but it could be improved. The role of NDMS needs to be strengthened because quite frankly, we know that the healthcare in infrastructure in the United States is always on the margins of being overwhelmed because of emergency rooms during a bad flu season being overwhelmed as a result of a local you know, disaster. Look at what happened in Las Vegas with the shooting event. Uh, again, uh, not necessarily on my tenure, but where you had hundreds of people wounded by a uh, mass shooting event. And so those are the things that you need to do that. And again, I just want to highlight 
the public sector piece of this, which is the public health, uh, the public uh, sector piece is not only in the pharmaceutical industry, it's in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. And it's in the supply chain industry. Mm -hmm. And those things have to be managed in a way that is proactive and appropriate in terms of working as a true partnership. The other thing I'll just comment on is the programs that enable ASPR to do its role. I talked about NDMS and the hospital preparedness program. They're kind of divergent. They're almost like they don't intersect. And so the idea of having all this money to be used for hospital preparedness that really doesn't do anything for surge capacity or training or exercises for the healthcare workers who are going to have to manage these events, sometimes very uh, difficult events like infectious disease outbreaks or potential chemical biological hazardous events, uh, that's important to realize. And also with that is the industrial base expansion. I think that was discussed already about the SNS. Somehow we got to be smarter in how to do this. We can't afford a, an unlimited budget with the strategic national stockpile, but working with the public sector and working with the providers, the manufacturers, and the distributors of products, we can do better at baseline and more critically during a regional or national event. Mm -hmm. Obviously, medical countermeasures figure prominently into that as well. And I think a session future will be talking about the role of BARDA and all that. The last thing I'm going to talk about is probably the third rail in any conversation with Congress right now, and that's the issue of resources. But I got to tell you, if you don't touch on that point in this bill, we'll have missed a tremendous opportunity. Because let me tell you how it was in early and mid-January 2024, and Kevin being my witness, is that we realized that we were looking into the face of a pandemic, number one. 2020, no, what? Um, sorry, 2020. Right. Sorry, sorry. What, yeah. what did they say? 24. I'm way ahead of myself here. He was, he was driving the car. I'm like, going like warp speed, man. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, 2020, and, and realize that we did not get a dollar appropriated uh, to use to buy for PPE, to develop medical countermeasures until March 5th. That was a significant delay, and quite frankly, a delay that cost people lives. So there's got to be a way to create something like the Disaster Relief Fund that could be used for these kind of extraordinary medical events that is not located at CDC, I'm sorry to say, but is really the responsibility of the secretary to figure out who needs to get what resources in a, in a high level emergency. It can't be anything, but it's gotta be defined as something that is of national significance. So with that, I look forward to your questions and I just, again, it's a, pri it's a privilege to get the kind of the band back together again. I'm sorry Nikki Lurie's not here, but, but she'll uh, have an opportunity, I'm sure, to come and give you her thoughts as well. But I think the point here is anyone who sits in these chairs realizes that it's the greatest mission in the world, but the hardest mission in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly one every day that I just thank God that I had the chance to do. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all for that. I'll start off um, just with a few questions because we've had a lot of <clears throat> breadth. So hopefully get a little more depth and then we'd like to open it up and uh, make it a little more interactive. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Von Der Reagan, I'm wondering, uh, in March of 2020, a lot of us became aware of supply chain issues, especially when you look at test kits, um, reagents that were made overseas. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk in terms of like a capacity, capability, but also security. What are the things that we need to be thinking about to ensure that we have um, the, the supply chain, you know, the base that we need for therapeutics, for countermeasures, for uh, diagnostics, uh, and vaccines so they're there when we need them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And Steve, this is gonna be familiar terrain for you, I expect, where you are, but um, I, would, I would say the following, that you need to think about the supply chain from the point of view of what is needed understand how we can mitigate or reduce the risks of shortages, whether those are chronic shortages, insulin, etc., or whether there are shortages that occur in a disaster. And remember, that's a demand surge requirement uh, that's there. Uh, on the other side of that, you could have supply shortages. So demand surge is the disaster challenge, and how do you account for that? I think, again, I'll go back to the work group that we had uh, within uh, the National Academy and point out to you that we, we framed it from the point of view that to deal with this, you need to have data, you need to be able to analyze that data, 
and to share that data, creating an awareness. That awareness of what is going on in the supply chain and what do we need to be aware of and what can we uh, intervene in. And we spoke to three different components to it. There's mitigation, there's preparedness, and then there's response. Now in mitigation, think about the things that you can do to support hardening of this system. Uh, and hardening in this case could be things like how do we protect plants in Puerto Rico that produce IV solutions from hurricanes? <laughs> uh, how do we prevent fires in uh, critical elements of that supply chain, you know, the API developers or the raw material people, et cetera. Those are hardening questions that we can answer potentially and business and the public sector can work together. A second thing to be thinking about is redundancies in that system. And I'm cribbing off uh, a document that's available to you. Uh, and that's diversification. So that, for instance, instead of having one source of raw materials, you have two or three sources of raw materials. So that if one falls apart, you've got a backstop. You've got a second alternative. Same thing with API production. Same thing with production of the fill and finish. Same thing with the distribution. What are the diversified capabilities that we can capitalize on to mitigate the risk that we're going to not be able to meet a supply demand surge? Preparedness involves inventory stockpiling. We all talk about the SNS, national, states are talking about it. The hospitals have gone from the just-in-time to three-day to five-day consideration in terms of their ability to have an internal stockpile so that they have some buffer. Capacity buffering is the kind of thing we're talking about here. And, and again, we use DPA uh, authorities to create potential capacity buffering by warm basing manufacturing processes so that when we need them, they're there. Same thing with contingency planning. You can you could fund warm basing, but you can also negotiate with these businesses for, well, if this happens, here's the kind of pricing that we'll offer you as a premium for you to be in a position to be responsive to us when we have that challenge. You can have readiness strategies uh, in play, and those kind of things have to do with what does the distribution system look like is it ready? Is it prepared? How do we know that it's ready? And that goes to the exercising principles that, that both Bob and Kevin talked about. And lastly, you know, there's response elements. Demand reduction. How can you reduce demand for X therapeutic, X diagnostic, X vaccine, and substitute something that has a similar effect, et cetera? We saw a lot of that in COVID in ICUs because we ran out of certain kinds of drugs that they need while people are on ventilators and they ended up doing substitutions. Uh, and so they were reducing a little bit the demand on X drug to go to Y drug until we could get more of X drug in play. And lastly, you know, we can do things around prophylaxis uh, within the population. So again, there are a number of things that can be done in mitigation, preparedness, and response, but they're predicated on having information, analyzing that information, sharing that information out, and then acting to the gaps and challenges that we see in front of us. And, and John, I, I hope that answers your question. No, I think it did, but I want to, can I get a copy of that? Or did Andy write it and I'm already supposed to know about it? No, no. It, this, is, uh, this is a report from the National Academy of Medicine uh, I'll send you the consensus study report, and you can share that with the staff. Yeah, they've probably seen it, but you know, uh, you know, this is something we could provide to them. And we have a very nice. I mean, the graphics are very nice, and so you not you can get the idea of looking at the graphics and then dig in on the details of what do they mean by uh, hardening? What do they mean by uh, inventory buffering? So we'll be glad to share that. And Great, thank you. And it's a congressional product, by the way. You guys paid for it, so. <laughs> Dr. Parker, I'm wondering, you were talking about um, that you can't, you know, legislate excellence. You know, from my time in the service, I realized sometimes the louder you yell, you don't necessarily get, you know, exactly what you want. 
Um, but I'm wondering, because I couldn't talk or brief to anyone without having an organization chart, without having clearly defined roles or also processes. Um, you had mentioned the control tower uh, concept. I'm wondering, when you, when you look at that and you think of, you know, having, you know, developing rules now for looking at an emergency situation, are there things you can think of that we should be um, capturing now to help us, you know, when that bad day comes? Sure, yeah, thank, thank you. And first, um, first and foremost, I think we need to thank uh, Dr. Catholic for some of his leadership during the crisis of COVID. And, and it was really his, his driving leadership that thought about the control tower and how to integrate the data analytics and try to get the real-time information uh, so that um, the, um, at the federal level, actually crisis that were going to be happening several days out could be anticipated. And then, and almost and verify, you know, at the local level with a, a, a local hospital healthcare system at a local level, are, 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 are you experiencing what we're seeing at our level? And then, you know, ask the right question. Do you need help? Do you need um, uh, additional personnel? Or do you have mechanisms to get it? So it's really, it, it's that control tower function that relies on data analytics and near real time data information on supply chains. Uh, and I'm talking about the medical supply chains primarily, but it's not limited to the medical supply chains, but just healthcare capacity, the, the workforce in the, in the hospitals, and what is their census, and which, which, which way is that census trending? Is it going up, is it going down? Uh, and what do we see as far as the, the number of cases in the, in the community? Is it expected to go up? So that control tower could give you the almost real-time information of, of uh, where problems would be in the future so you can anticipate anticipate what kind of resources are going to be needed until it's too late when uh, which is generally what happens you uh, we get a request for help and it's already overwhelmed so we need to set up these structures and the data analytics and the data information sharing networks that will enable that um, and that's easier said than done because of just you know, information sharing, some of it's proprietary, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to, and this has been a long-term problem to, to figure that out, so we, but we've got to figure it out uh, so those switches can be turned on in um, real time when the, the need comes. So it's, it comes down to the leadership issue, it's having the structure, um, and, and I do think ASPR is the right place to embed this, this component of a control tower function for this data analytics for the healthcare system and the supply chains of the healthcare system after all, that's where uh, some of the supply chain management now is located. The SNS is located. Bar has got a surge in, say, manufacturing for something in the medical uh, lane for disasters. So it's all there. The ingredients are all there. So it just makes sense. Okay, how do we set this control tower framework so it's always running, and that control tower frame can be surged instantly uh, to turn on the information networks. Again, easier said than done, but that's really kind of the principle. And Dr. Catholic may want to um, elaborate on that because he was right in it, and it was really his his vision that drove that during the, during the crisis, and it took a while for everybody that was part of that to kind of let go of some of the data and realize that, that doing so would be beneficial to everybody across the whole healthcare system in the United States. And just briefly, I would just say that uh, to, to Jerry's point that the intent was really to see oneself, if you will, to let the federal government share with states principally. Again, this was a transparency issue to Craig's point, sharing that information so they could see themselves, see the healthcare systems and the logistical systems in their state. If they wanted to share that information with an adjacent state, they could if they wanted. But it was the whole point of being able to be predictive at least to seven days out, which was probably the best that we could, to actually anticipate increasing trends of events, meaning cases that would inundate an area and then work with the state and the local authorities and the facilities to manage that in advance of the crisis happening. It did take until the fall of 2020, so think about that. March is when the, the balloon goes up, so to speak, and it took almost six months to, to, to basically put that together. Uh, but I think it's something, if you haven't been briefed, you should ask for it from ASPR. Green light, it was called. It was uh, it, the program has kind of been transferred to CDC. Uh, that, that's a call, um, but I think the point here is that was a great enabling tool during the the the, uh, the pandemic. And the guy who did it was a guy named Sam Imbriali. I'll spell it for you if you want, but 
that's a briefing if you get. I think it would be very, uh, I think it would be enlightening to see what we were able to do. That's great. Thank you both very much for that. Um, Dr. Yeski, building on a lot of the remarks you had earlier talking about um, you know, how things start locally and local and really the, the job, it's not a federal system, it's that national level response. Um, is there anything that when you look specifically at PAPA reauthorization that you'd like to see in there that really, that really hits on that? And again, it resonates with me from my time uh, in the service as a social awareness disposal guy because you realize like it, it is that local part that counts. So um, I appreciate that perspective. I was wondering if you wanted to um, expand on that by chance. So a couple of things. One is, you know, healthcare systems work in referral areas. They don't work necessarily across juris within jurisdictional boundaries. So, for instance, a, a medical center may fly patients outside the state to a neighboring hospital because they have that that expertise or that specialty uh, capability there. But when funding goes out and when exercises are done, they're largely done within that state because of kind of the restrictions on, the, on how the money can be spent. And, and th there's not much flexibility in that regard. Mm -hmm. So that, that is one of the ways where locals kind of get hampered by the, by the, the way the funding comes from, it, from ASPR. So having some flexibility and being able to spend that. Also, might as well get a point in about regionalization. You know, I talked to, the questions about lo local, uh, local response. States, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm talking about multiple state, multi-state regions, because of the referral patterns, because of the sharing of resources and the different differences in plans and protocols across boundaries, and, and sometimes those don't mesh very well. You know, so having a, a regional capability and a, a piece that, that, that will get resistance by some, but has been more, wide, more and more widely accepted is what's called a medical operations center, where you have one organization that controls, coordinates, I wouldn't say controls, but, con but, but coordinates the patient distribution during a disaster. They set it up, it's a, it's, it's a neutral party, uh, they're not biased towards sending all the paying patients to their facilities and not paying patients elsewhere, but it, it, it's, a, it, it's a neutral body that coordinates pa patient distribution, coordinates resource requests, because not everyone you know, has the same resources. You can't expect rural hospitals to have the same as some of the urban facilities, but it coordinates the uh, resources. It also provides situational awareness across the region. And, uh, you know, Asper had done a couple of uh, uh, pilots with, with Dr. Cavett. We did a couple of pilot projects there, uh, and, and their reports are out. And it shows that taking this, pro this, this, this regional concept facilitates the local capabilities, and it facilitates the larger region, depending on what that is. It could be New England, could be Southeastern United States. Uh, it, 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 it helps them share resources, helps them share best practices, helps them share lessons learned from events, and helps them coordinate protocols, procedures, and, and exercises. So I think those are important things that, that you know, the expansion of the, the ASPR has, what, five now region, regional pilots? Mm -hmm. Expanding that out a little bit more would be useful to, to see, take what they've learned, and then build that out some more. Because I think that's, a, that's a, a concept, much like the healthcare coalition concept that we started back in 2010, uh, which is now the foundation of healthcare uh, preparedness in the country. Uh, I think that's a, that's a concept that would really benefit mm -hmm. uh, further, further examination and further exploration. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Dr. Kellick, I know um, we look at our country, we've got a great history of public-private partnerships, you know, in both routine times but also emergencies from radar to railroads to all kinds of things. Um, when you look at that, can you think of how um, we could use it uh, in terms of both hospital resiliency but also for supply chain? Sure, and, and I think it's the same thing that you would do is, as we do with medical countermeasures. And again, I think the hospital system is very, uh, I think, open to this idea, which is that, and again, I use the hospital preparedness program as an example where you could use funds and optimize their use for the purposes of expanding hospital-based regional uh, capabilities that could be addressing certain, as we identified during our tenure and actually preceded my tenure was actually Dr. Lurie, 
who uh, developed those that were called NETEC for the, for the Ebola network that was invaluable during the pandemic, the early stages of the pandemic. And so how can you do that? And it's really kind of both cost sharing, but using those funds in a way that's directed to expand training so that you can actually, in a region, train more facilities, train more healthcare providers to do this, train EMS in ways that we haven't done today, because it's really the fundamentals of preparedness is really train, you know, you know, organizing, training, and equipping to your military experience, uh, people to do a function under duress. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the critical element and exercises. So I think that's an example of a private partnership for healthcare. On the supply chain t system too, it is about working on innovation as we would want to. It, Craig gave a great example about the problem that we encountered after Maria. And yes, the, the majority of IV fluids were being made in, in Puerto Rico that obviously was shut down, not because the facility was damaged, but because there was no power. And so one of the things we actually invested in, with, with, in within, through BARDA and BARDA Drive was developing technology that would allow us to make IV fluid, sterile IV fluid, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country that could be distributed in a hospital, it could be distributed in a clinic. In fact, we did it with Baxter development, co-development with Baxter and CVS, so that this could be done for the, for the benefit of everybody. But it also is a benefit in disasters and crisis situations. By the way, in the case of um, when you lose power, when you lose water, you could actually use this device to make sterile fluids that could be packaged into IV fluids, yes, right into little bags, anywhere from pond water. So that's the kind of thing, the kind of, I guess, creativity you need to take to the problem set, which is private partnerships can be in a, a lot of different ways. It could be to work together closer, engaging in people to do things that they wouldn't normally do because they don't have the resources or the, or the expertise to do so, as well as invest in, in innovations that are really, you know, groundbreaking, as well as changing the dynamics in the landscape to Craig's point, resilience, right? That's a resilient system of manufacture of IV fluids mm -hmm. that you can make anywhere. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's a technology that we can give to anybody. And by the way, the guy who developed it first developed it to make potable water in Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a way to help with the crisis of pure water drinking water. Can I add one comment to that? And that comment is that if you're going to have effective public-private sector partnerships, one has to realize that businesses have to have a runway of multiple years so they can see where their investment's going and how it's going to play out. And annualized funding or budgeting just kills those kind of public-private partnerships. You need to have a five, three, five, ten year window to really bring the partnerships to the table because they need to plan. They need to understand where their capital investment is going to have to be made, how they can sequence that capital investment, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not here to promote private business necessarily, but I'm telling you, if you're going to have an effective public private partnership, you've got to think about some of these realities uh, if you're going to call for it. You got to do the things, the tools. You got to provide the tools to make it work. And by the way, I think <coughs> that Kern Asper has made a nice uh, series of testimony in the health committee and then yesterday with the ENC uh, about what tools she needs to make the IBD work, the industrial base uh, ma management uh, component work and so on. So. Uh, I'm not here to talk about all the technical details, and really that's her domain, but she's talking about tools and that's what we're talking about. She needs the tools, but the principle has to be clear on the front end. Where's the leadership, what's the mission, and what are the priorities? And it, just to add to the public-private partnership is that I don't think we've really gotten it right yet, but it's how do you incentivize? And how do you have the right it, um, it just, it's got to get beyond just transactional and FAR-based contracts, but how do you really incentivize the private sector as a long-term partner? And that, it's easier said than done. Again, all these things are easier said than OTAs. done. OTAs. And it is about, about the right incentives. Right. 
Well, since that's three folks mentioning the uh, third rail again, I'd love to jump on another question, but uh, mindful of our time, I'd like to open it up to the audience members if there's anything that you would like to ask any of the speakers today. Back row there. Thank you. Um, uh, Nathan Calvin, I'm, I'm with the fellow with Senator Pappadia's office, and I'm also a, a CSR ending bioweapons fellow. Um, uh, I'm kind of curious to um, Secretary uh, Cadillac's point uh, about kind of reorienting uh, the ask permission to kind of new, new threats and kind of incorporating the, the DNI's uh, assessment about kind of what you see as the, the main obstacles towards doing that. I, I know that, that this is something that you know, you see discussions about in, in other um, parts of government of, you know, reorienting the, the DOD to, to n new threats and, and kind of how that matches up with the, their current kind of allocation of assets. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, one, one thing in particular that com comes to mind is kind of orienting um, BARDA and other sub subsets por portfolios towards kind of, you know, like disease X, threat, threat agnostic mm -hmm. uh, materials that are, um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of curious about what you see as some of the main barriers there, where, where some of that is kind of, you know, they have the authorities, and it's about kind of the, the personnel prioritizing that versus kind of um, needing a, a additional either um, authorities or prescriptions from sure. from Congress. Um, so yeah, any any thoughts on how to kind of yeah re sure. it? Sure. So that? I think big, biggest challenge is the cultures, public health versus the intelligence and national security world. And where now people are beginning to understand that this is an example like the pandemic of the, of the convergence of public health and national security, it's incumbent, I think, in the future, Papa, to, to be explicit about that. And, and I had the benefit of before becoming the ASPR, probably had the one job that was extraordinary, at least in preparing me for that role, which I was the deputy staff director of the Senate uh, Select Int uh, Intelligence Committee. And, and with that, I, I spent two and a half years getting all the bad news you can imagine mm -hmm. uh, about every facet to what American national security could be threatened. So the thing is, is that somehow you have to recognize, and let me give you an example of that. I'll give you a tangible example about that, cybersecurity. And so if before I became the ASPR, I was on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and North Korea cybered using a ransomware attack on the national health system in, in the UK in April and May of 2017. Uh, and, and so that was kind of like a warning, if you will. My experience was, was during the pandemic on Christmas Day of 2020, when uh, a fellow, uh, a deranged fellow in Nashville, Tennessee, filled his camper with uh, explosives and detonated his camper and himself by an AT&T sw AT switching station that impacted over 100 9-11 systems in 11 states, directly affected three healthcare systems, including HCA, Vanderbilt and St. Thomas, where they lost their electronic records, they lost access to digital radiography, and it was not on the basis of a state declaration or a national declaration that we organized ourselves and reached out to those states and those healthcare people proactively to basically match them up with the, the major uh, providers around that. So the thing is, it, it takes uh, initiative, it takes leadership, and it takes an open aperture to the world you live in to understand you need to do that. Now, you can say that's an impossible task, but the thing is, is now when people are talking about hypersonic missiles potentially laden with nuclear bombs landing on the United States as a consequence of our you know, relationship with China, Russia, and North Korea uh, as possibilities, and maybe Iran soon, I think you can't just ignore the fact that things of this nature can happen, and you're gonna to have to do that. And somehow you're gonna to have to, I would say, educate and also force, if you will, a, a department like HHS to kind of you know, smell the roses. Yeah, you're gonna add, Jared, go ahead. Yeah, and maybe to add one way to think about it, because we, we do have to meld these cultures of health and security and have to become reflexive that, that whatever the event that may be that you need to consider of course natural but unnatural sources of you know whatever the, the event may be and so initially that ought to be reflexive and it's not right now mm -hmm. yeah and, and the one other piece i would add to this is that <clears throat> i think that if the language in papa broadly expresses the threat and responsibility you know when we picked it up in 2007 it was the 15 national threats and I saw emerging infectious disease as being something we were going to be dealing with. 
but it wasn't listed in the 15 national threats, so I was told, don't spend money on it. Um, and so I think the authorizing language has to take into account that there are threats that are not particularly directly foreseen that need to be included as something that is appropriate for the mission space that, that ASPR has, whether that's cyber or whether it's emerging infectious disease, et cetera. Because people will use what's in the language to limit what you do. I just want one comment is, is prior to the, to the uh, pandemic, talked to a lot of people about New Madrid earthquake. And, and when, you know, that's a large area, multiple geographic challenges, multiple uh, uh, significant infrastructure impacts. And you talk to people and their answer was, well, we'll just work harder. That won't get you in a big one. That won't get you through it. You have to. You have to, the rules are a little bit different. Whether that's crisis standards of care, whether that's how you how you communicate and all and all that. But it has to be different. People have to understand that they can't just fall back on well, I'll, I'll pull a thirty-six hour shift. That's not going to help. You know, the, 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 the bridges are down. You have to get people from one side of the river to the other. How are you going to do that? And you're, if you don't think that way through exercises in a in a, in a routine manner about, okay, so that doesn't work anymore. What are you going to do? And, and force people to have realistic exercises and not, not just be able to make stuff up. That's what, that's what helps in these times when there's, when, when there's really bad things going on, is to work smarter, work by different rules, and to not just fall back on the day-to-day -day reflexes that you might have developed in your, in your, in your professional discipline. Uh, thanks so much for all this. Uh, my name is Scott Weathers. I'm with Matt Cartwright's office. Uh, I'd love to hear if y'all have any recommendations or thoughts on uh, uh, engineered pandemic specific, uh, preventing engineered pandemic specifically. Um, you know, with the emergence of chat GPT, I think there's been a lot of discussion around the AI bio intersection. Um, uh, but obviously this category is bigger than that. So I'd just love to hear any of your thoughts. I'll, I'll sort of then turn to Jerry. But here's the thing is there's a document that just came out from Georgetown uh, Center for Security and Emerging Threats, CSEC, that looked at the, the, the seven most likely p pathogens or families of viruses that could cause a pandemic. And so the thing is, if you could just tackle that in, prospectively and saying how can we create an encyclopedia of potential you know, countermeasures, diagnostics, therapeutics, potentially vaccines, that would be something. And again, I'll be very happy to share that document through CSR to share with you all because I think it'd be very useful to at least have an organizing thought. The world could be much bigger, but if you can manage, you know, if you can kind of address that as to begin with, I think that would go a long way to help you think through the other possibilities. And you do need an early warning, rapid response capability to deal with the threat that you just defined. Mm -hmm. What he said, <laughs> but, but essentially, I mean, it gets back to, um, um, we have to have, have um, a, a solid you know, preparedness uh, strategy for dealing in, uh, to put just right now the biological threats. And we have to take seriously all biological threats, whether they're natural, whether they're accidental, or whether they're intentional. And we need to be thinking about that. And our, and our public health community needs to work with the interagency and, and across multiple disciplines more than we do today. And it, and it has to become initially, we got to consider whether it's natural or unnatural from the start. And until proven otherwise, one way, one of those things, and and it may take a while to, to figure that out. But our response may may be very similar initially, um, whether it's engineered, whether it's accidental, whether it's natural. Uh, but we have to have uh, our our response and our scientific enterprise. We have to put much more focus on on not a list based approach. That's why we're trying to move away from the list based approach. And you can see that in the NSABB recommendations for doing this research. Um, of emerging um, um, technologies and emerging threats, it's moving away from a list-based approach to these things, and we need, and our response needs to move away from that too. And we have to, this culture, could it be natural, could it be unnatural, and we have to have the early warning, but we also have to have the investigation that starts, and for investigation for attribution, whether this natural or unnatural, needs to start very early too, because so uh, when too much time passes, you lose any opportunity for attribution. Either way, um, so it's really it's a culture that we need to inculcate in our preparedness enterprise for all biological threats of any source. 
Yes, please. Yeah, could each of you kind of speak to some of the obstacles for when you're trying to characterize uh, a new threat and recognizing you know, some of the developments you've seen in sequencing and in genomics, um, what some of the barriers to entry are and how we're, we're creating synergy between um, you know, that innovation but then also you know, the national security enterprise that needs to, to be responsive to that and, and work jointly. Well, I, I, everybody's looking at me, so I, I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> Uh, so I mean, this is this is a huge area too. And actually, there's I mean, this goes back almost a decade too. Actually, HHS when I was still there back in 2010, he maybe maybe released one of the first kind of strategies for dealing with genomic sequencing and, and guidance for industry and and how to um, to screen and, and provide guidance. And in reality, the industry was ahead of any government guidance because the, the industry knows it is in their best interest to not do something that's going to allow. Their, the output of what they're doing to be misapplied. And so industry has, has a lot of incentives. That doesn't mean that we let everything up to um, industry to develop those, those guidelines. And so we have to work very closely with, with industry. And, and I think there's a lot of activity you know, a, a, about how to do this yet. I don't have the answers, but I think you know, one of the things that, that you know, Asper has had a role in, in, in um, promoting such guidance, and that's probably something that should be included in PAPA to continue that role, exactly how you know we can work on that, work on some, you know, how best to articulate that in a proper reauthorization. But it's it's an important role, um, and there's there'll be more to come. The NSABB, in fact, did not kind of get on get on that topic um, um, recently, but it's something that the NSABB ought to, ought to take up as well in future um, iterations of, of that advice, federal advisory board. Um, there are several NGOs working on that uh, uh, that issue that's you know working with industry and so forth. So there's going to be more information on that coming out very soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean there's <clears throat> we can add some granularity to that process. And again, the National Academy we two months ago had Asha George shared this for us. Asha is a former staff member of ENC, uh, looking at all the laboratories in play, not just the public health laboratory network managed by CDC, but academic labs, private sector labs, et cetera, to, because we had people doing a whole lot of things without any necessary coordination of that information flow. And so we brought together those stakeholders and there should be a transcript out shortly that goes through a variety of specific steps that could be taken to engage in a much more robust database that crosses the sectors from the public health labs to academic labs to private labs to be clear about who's doing what with regards to genomic sequencing and what we've learned from it, et cetera. So again, it's, it's a database that needs to be developed that brings across all the stakeholders to the table and then a common database that we share among us so that we're all informed. I would just simply add that this is an example of what could be a public, a great public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. in the, I think in the pandemic we recognized the liabilities of going to potentially one place, uh, in this case CDC, to kind of be the, the arbiter of this, where you have multiple diagnostic companies and diagnostic laboratory systems out there already that can be capitalized. Mm -hmm. So there is no barrier today to be able to, to sample X percent of, of samples, blood, urine, whatever, uh, on a daily, weekly, or whatever basis you want to look for things that matter to our society. Same thing with sewage. Here is the question of just simply organization, uh, creating a coalition of the willing, and then probably some element of federal subsidy, as well as having the, the industry put in some money on this to do this, because they do it every day, is actually create the network and, and create an architecture to do this. In fact, it can be done the compatibility between PCR detection and sequencing exists mm -hmm. so that you could arguably screen for whatever for, for your highest threats and be able to sequence those things within a few hours, meaning is within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Good. I wanted to go back to something uh, Dr. Catholic mentioned in, in his uh, open remarks, something to consider, and, and comes with 
um, the availability of resources, you know, right after a disaster happens, and, and you can't really do anything until you have the resources, or you can't really make a, a significant impact until, until there's an emergency supplemental pass, and et cetera, et cetera. There is an example at USAID, US Agency for International Development, and I don't remember the name of it, but we can, I, I can, I can get it, and you can look at it. But I, I I've been um, informed about this from a former um, USAID minister, um, Andrew Natsios. Um, but there's a special fund in USAID uh, that's pretty significant that authorizes the administrator to take immediate action in the event of a disaster globally. And, um, and so the monies can start flowing almost immediately um, a after disaster. And so something like that is some something that should be considered for, for ASPR. I can get the name of that special fund, that special authorization, but it's, I think it's, it may be unique in the federal government to have, to have that. FEMA's got a little bit too with the Stafford Act, but um, this, this is a, a unique fund that's available to the USAID Administrator for International Disasters. And I would just suggest that that authority go to the secretary, yeah. uh, because I think he's the one who has to pull the trigger. He's the one who makes a declaration of a public health emergency, and it should be narrowly, very narrowly defined, so it just can't be used for anything. It's got to be used for the things that are recognized as catastrophic or potentially catastrophic. <clears throat> All right, time for one more question. There's one stop there. Can I ask a question of the audience? <laughs> so, why not, right? <laughs> so, um, breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> yeah, I guess whatever. So, um, so is ASPR necessary? Can we can we go around the room and just pull the people here and just say, do you think it serves a useful function? Uh, you don't have to bob your head. I want to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the question is, is that you know. We created this thing in 2005 and six. You know, I would say that having been in the seat during the pandemic, you know, we can call balls and strikes. And you know, we we had we had a few hits, but we didn't play our best game. But I'm just wondering if you know if you think your investment of time and effort in this kind of legislation, you know, is is worth your time and effort, <laughs> and is it is it something that you think the American people benefit from? So uh, it's more more opening myself up for another case of PTSD, <laughs> but it is the, the intent here to, to, to get to see what you guys think. Well, well, that gives me an opportunity to kind of turn it right back. I mean, it's, it, it's a satchel. I think Asper's, you know, proven its case uh, over this time period. And, uh, and what I've also seen is there's a pretty, um, a pretty good bipartisan tradition on our committee, and I, I suspect on the Senate committee, well, I mean, not suspect, I know, on the Senate committee as well. And I guess the question is, that given that degree of bipartisanship, is the reauthorization of PAPA an opportunity to make a case uh, to the American people about pulling together on pandemic preparedness because the thing that alarms me <clears throat> right now is something was lost in our pandemic response. Mm -hmm. Things that, I mean, I, <clears throat> was, I was up here <laughs> after 9-11 too, and we were very unified. We all pulled together. There was common purpose. And I don't think we ever got to that point in our response um, as a country and things that were not politicized, I never thought of as political issues. You know, there's not a Republican way to remove snow or a Democratic way to remove snow. I mean, they're things that have got to get done. And, and somehow uh, uh, we had an incredible achievement with Operation Warp Speed, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and yet, now we've, vaccines have gotten politicized, you know, among other things. The, uh, the, we've got a real challenge with our state and local public health infrastructure. They need more support, not more skepticism. So 
what are the, I mean, I just see it as an opportunity to make a broader case that needs to be made is to, how do we pull this country back together again uh, if, if we're gonna make it on the next pandemic? I mean, it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. We may not be so lucky the next time, and it's really vital that we somehow rediscover common purpose here. Uh, any thoughts on, on on how we can help make that case or how our members could help make such a case? Excuse the one, too. <laughs> well, I think it comes down to leadership, number one. Number two is a unified effort at the very top of government. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the role of a White House coordinator can a, a permanent position in that can go a long way to help bring stability and predictability to what future administrations. It would be nice to think that that would not be a political appointee per se, but more a professional appointee that would be enduring, kind of like the FBI director, have a six year tenure that would transcend uh, that. But I think the point here is, I think that's, it's got to stop a, a start at the top. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, and, and, but I would argue is, don't disagree. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it had to be, the White House had to be supportive so that, you know, if I had a problem with trying to get Transcom to offer me, I didn't have an Air Force, but I needed to move patients. If I needed Transcom, I'd go to Bob at the White House and Fran would say, okay, let's get everybody together and let's do it. Let's figure out what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> but it goes to Kevin's point too. And that is that we're disconnected from the communities that we serve in a significant way. And uh, we talk about culture change in the public health establishment, and I would agree fully. I mean, I teach at Harvard School of Public Health, and my students, man, I'm putting them out there and saying, you better understand, first and foremost, how the community understands the problem and what solutions they're interested in before you come in and tell them, here's your problem, here's the solution. Now, I come by that legitimately. My dad was the chief veterinarian for the state of California. And when he had Newcastle outbreak and he had hot cholera outbreak, the last thing he wanted was somebody from CDC coming out and telling him, here's what you're going to do. Uh, and this, that undermines the institution's credibility. And so there's a cultural thing that we have to sort of articulate as we talk through the POPA reauthorization, and that is that it, it is service to the people. I felt that I was a family doc responsible for 300 million people in 2007. That's who I was responsible to. And we, our mission was driven by that sense of responsibility as, as was spoken to. And that isn't there at the moment. And so, part of the discussion around Papa offers an opportunity to revisit the kind of concept that Kevin talked about, a national plan that assumes first and foremost that it's the community that's in the driver's seat and that our role is to articulate with them how they perceive problems and threats. I mean, you know, hurricanes don't matter to anybody in the Intermountain West. Right? I mean, you know, you can talk hurricane planning until the cows come home. It doesn't mean crap to them. But if you talk about the big earthquake in Yellowstone, or you talk about flooding, or you talk about wildfires, then they're interested. So I think the opportunity here is let's talk first and foremost. Yes, we have a responsibility at the leadership level to engage it but we also have to bring communities into a central role in how they understand disaster and how they understand what they expect the state or the feds or anybody else to do in support to them because we've got to disconnect completely and the institutions are not trusted uh, and how to bring that trust back has to start with dialogue, first and foremost, mutual respect. Then you can start to build trust. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're just talking. And they're talking, and we're not listening. And, and what they said. Um, but, but I think it really does, um, recalling that 
the original PAPA authorization was, was built on a solid foundation of bipartisan support with Senator Kennedy, Senator Byrd at the time, based on disaster experiences that we'd have from 911, anthrax, SARS, um, Katrina, et cetera, et cetera. So it was based on those, those real world experiences and then solid bipartisan support. So we need to recall that and remember that. Um, but first and foremost, kind of the three things, what, what was Asper uh, envisioned to do, and, and that was, was to provide the necessary leadership, pro professional career leadership, um, one, across the HHS family, but within the interagency for, for coordinating and leading medical public health in support of, this is the key, I think, is really in support of state, local, tribal, territory authorities and building those public-private partnerships. We're not, ASPR is not was not a built and established to be another inside the Beltway organization. It was built and established to support others. And I think reemphasizing that support to others is maybe maybe an important message to help um, to help in this time that uh, everything is so divisive. And, and we do need to take pandemic preparedness and of all hazards seriously because this won't be our last. But we do need <laughs> maybe this is an opportunity to change that dialogue and have at least one topic that we can talk about in a bipartisan way. Well, thank you. I, that's the challenge for us. I mean, that's the challenge of the day is how do we get the hyper-partisanship out of this. Uh, the pathogens don't care what your party affiliation <laughs> is. And, uh, the people on this panel have about 200 years of public service combined across administrations. I, I served from the Reagan administration through the Obama administration. Some of us also served at, at you know, Senate confirmed uh, I started with positions <laughs> overall <laughs> like you, um, public servants at heart. And, and uh, this is an opportunity um, to um, prove that this is not a partisan issue that we can improve on uh, what we learned uh, through this uh, tragedy of the last three years. And uh, it is preventable. And, and indeed, uh, the Council on Strategic Risks, we believe we can take bioweapons off the table and pandemics with the sustained investment, with the smart public-private partnerships. This is a tractable problem. And uh, we, we've made progress. And, we have to avoid backsliding, but this is an opportunity. So thank you uh, for, for co-hosting this first event, and uh, thank you all on, on the panel for bringing your just uh, incredible uh, experiences uh, to the table and making them available. Uh, and thank you for coming on Friday to, to the staff members here. And uh, let us know, uh, you yeah, know, I can give you my card, my email, but if you have suggestions, we're going to make this uh, a regular series in the, in the coming weeks and months, and uh, whatever we can do. CSR, we live in the center, we're, we're nonpartisan, and whatever we can do to help with convening and, and educating, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. So thank you very much, and have a great week. And don't forget, if we don't have health, we don't have security. <laughs> That's the end. Grab a lunch. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll Thanks. be in touch. Yeah. Harry, oh, sir, it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Good to see you, Kevin. Good to see you. Just a last question.